Chapter 13 Master Lee had me haul him up over the balustrade, and then he slipped down from my back, and walked into the room, avoiding the blood as much as possible. "'Sir, the cage is already gone,' I said urgently. It felt strange to shout when I wanted to whisper, but the laughter from the courtyard below made whispering useless. "'I can't possibly catch that creature. It goes down walls as fast as I can run on a flat field, and how can I fly up and catch a crane?' "'Ox, stop driveling!' he snapped. "'I know the cage is gone, but we're damn well going to get something out of this.' He looked this way and that, standing on a dry patch of floor that remained like a narrow island in a sea of thick, gooey red, and then he turned and pointed. "'Get those curtains! Spread them across the floor to the conference table so we won't leave sandal prints. Yes, sir!' I did as I was told, and the old man walked over a path of green damask dragons that looked quite pretty with the crimson background, silver moonbeams, and golden candlelight. At the low jade-patterned table he searched beneath the end, where the tea-brazier stood, examining every inch of the thick fur rug, and then he picked up some tiny things, and grunted in satisfaction. When the bell sound announced a message coming from the cage, the Grand Warden and Lee the Cat jumped like rabbits, he said. I was almost sure the Warden dropped something, and he did. Praise the gods for sloppy cleaning maids. He had some shavings from that cake of tea, and one of the uncompressed leaves, and he put them in a compartment of his money belt. His wrinkles were squeezing so tightly around his eyes that they resembled the pattern on the ball of one's thumb, um, seen through the lens of a fire pearl. And as usual, he was considering problems I wouldn't even see until it was too late to do anything about them. Murder is not easily dismissed if the victim is Grand Warden of Goose Gate he said, thinking aloud. Lee the cat won't be a problem. The slangs are grotesque, and the cage is gone. He knows very well that two other Mandarin accomplices have been impossibly murdered and robbed of cages, and his first instinct should be to get the hell out and hurry home and see that nothing weird is taking place with his own cage, or with the other members of the plot. The problem will be the senior members of the Grand Warden's staff, who must prove they are faithful and efficient if they hope for future appointment. They'll launch an investigation that will hold us here for three months, and if we escape before the bodies are found, they'll charge us with murder and send the whole army in pursuit. The wrinkles squeezed tighter, and then relaxed as he came to a decision. He pointed and said, "'It will have to be a tiger after all. "'Get that, and keep your sandals out of the blood.' "'The walls were partially covered with animal skins. "'One of them was from a large tiger, complete with head and paws, "'and the old man had me take it down and neatly cut off the paws, "'and then hang it back up so the mutilation was as unobtrusive as possible. "'Nobody looks closely at such things. "'The upper classes say, "'Ah, a tiger skin, and leave it at that. "'And for every servant who says, didn't that thing have paws? There'll be two who say, You're crazy, Master Lee said confidently. He spread curtains until he had a path to the little door that led to the central tower, and he breathed a long sigh of relief to find the door unbarred on the inside and easily opened with a lockpick. Ox, dip those paws in blood and give us the clear tracks of a homicidal feline, he ordered. Make it look as though the tiger ripped the curtains down while chasing men around the room and plant prints over them. Don't forget bloody prints on the corpses and work your way backward to this door. I'll return as fast as possible. So I did as I was told, all the while wondering how on earth he planned to get away with it. Tigers don't swim moats and climb sheer stone walls and make their way through crowded courtyards and palaces. But I knew better than to say it was impossible. If Master Lee thought it could be done, it could be done. I was able to cheer myself up with that thought. But I wouldn't then have believed how easy it was going to be, and what an extraordinary turn of luck would come with it. I was just admiring my handiwork when the little door to the central tower opened, and there stood Master Lee, as I expected, and someone else I most certainly did not expect. The old man had brought the bandit chief's daughter. She had not been considered well enough to attend a play that might last more than three hours, and her eyes widened as she saw the carnage. 
Then she hissed and reached into her robe and whipped out a very efficient-looking dagger. And the next thing I knew, the point was pressed to my throat. Playmates should not be presumptuous, she snarled. I granted you a few minutes in bed, not a claim to be warden of Yen Men. Lady, great lady, Ox is strong, but not this strong, Master Lee said soothingly. A monster who happens to be a friend of ours lost his temper, not Ox, and we thought it might be a good idea to blame it on a tiger. Pretty paw prints, aren't they? The point left my throat, but not very far. The widow's eyes were warily fixed on Master Lee. It seemed to me, my lady, that a tiger would be useful in more ways than one, Master Lee continued. While treating you, I have seen your amulet. You were born in the year of the tiger, and the gods are not necessarily subtle when they choose to make their will clear. Very possibly they wish you to wed another and breed heroes. His voice was half shamanistic, half sage adviser, and for some reason the background of hysterical laughter from outside made the words seem weightier, not lighter. Now that you're all out of husbands, he said, you'll be required to choose either pious Confucian widowhood or priestly dispensation, and a second marriage like the first, a business alliance to advance your father's fortunes. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, if the bride is in a position to pick and choose among prospective grooms. Essential to that happy circumstance will be our clear and unchallenged departure. I knew he had won when she put the dagger away, but I most certainly didn't expect her next words. I had not expected murder, but I will admit I saw the monster. When it climbed down the wall, it came close by my window. Then she tossed the armload of bamboo on the fire, to coin a phrase. The moonlight struck the garish face, which is, of course, unmistakable. It is dangerous for you to be a friend of envy, but not, I think, dishonorable. I might have said something foolish, but Master Lee was close enough to kick me in the ankle. Ah, you know him, he said with pleased surprise. So few do, except, of course, for the owners of the cages. She ignored the baited hook and shook her head negatively. I did not say I knew him. I have seen the ancient painting in my father's country, and had the verses read to me. That's all. Now, I must know more of what you have in mind, she said firmly. So Master Lee told her, and I made gooey red tiger prints down the tower stairs into the various places, including a passage known only to the young widow and a few senior ministers, and I suppose the story is now known in villages from here to the Sabine Hills, how a beautiful princess was married against her will and carried off to a loathsome country, and how a magical tiger opened the secret escape passage that led from the bridegroom's castle, the doors were later found wide open with bloody paw prints leading out, and massacred the unworthy fellow and all his men, and how the princess awakened to find upon her pillow one half of a marriage contract ripped in a peculiar pattern, with a blood-stained tiger paw on it, and how a great shaman read the yarrow leaves, and explained that the princess, when a child, had been affianced to the tiger spirit by the ghost of her grandfather, and how her brief widowhood was ended with the appearance of a prince, whose mighty chest could not be seen because of all the medals, who had been born clutching a piece of parchment ripped in a peculiar pattern, and lo, it was half of a marriage contract stained by a tiger's paw. It doesn't matter that the lady hadn't, hasn't actually chosen the lucky fellow yet, at least I haven't heard of it, because not even her father dares cross tiger spirits. She has all the time she wishes to closely examine candidates. I hope she enjoys herself, and I think village storytellers, who are free to edit where historians are not, are wise to leave out the tadpoles. We had no trouble. The grieving widow took charge of the whole works, bellowing orders right and left, and Neo-Confucians, who were outraged at the presumption of a lowly female, received white wooden calling cards marked with red tiger paws, and protests ceased. Yen Shi's wagon rolled freely across the drawbridge the following afternoon, with me on the seat beside the puppeteer. Master Li and Yu Lan followed on mules, laden with gifts, and soon we were back in the land of the bandit chief, following his daughter's directions. The bright sunlight seemed to be swallowed by a long, slit-like mouth as we climbed down a narrow ravine. Cicadas were demonstrating why they're called scissors grinders, and lizards with 
eyes of coral and agate and turquoise practiced push-ups as they watched Yulan study the area's feng shui, wind and water. She was clearly disturbed by the totemistic arrangements of two piles of huge rocks. From your description, the creature called Envy is strongly masculine. But this place is overpowering in yin influences, not yang, she said in a puzzled voice. Instead of being proud and preopic, the totems are humble and bent, and seem to have been planned that way. But why would a shrine to an ape-man suggest crawling on one's knees in a female environment? Master Lee rechecked the map the Grand Warden's wife had given him. This is the place, unquestionably, he said. Yen Shi. The puppeteer smiled and flicked a hand in an eloquent gesture of passing the cup. My daughter is the expert, and I can offer only an instinctive reaction. The gesture ended with the forefinger lifted toward the totems. That doesn't strike me as being strictly symbolic or strictly representational, but something in between, like primitive writing, for example. Master Lee grinned. My friend, I'm beginning to think our minds move in lockstep, he said. I'm guessing it's a pictograph, specifically the pictograph of a mourner with bowed head, kneeling beside a corpse, representing a word in the earliest Shang dynasty writing known to exist. The word is death. Yulan? Yes, it could be, she said. Many goddesses are linked to the land of shadows, which would account for female emphasis in the geomancy. Still, that says nothing about a man with the face of a painted ape. What I wanted to know was whether or not the death influence was aimed at us, but I managed to keep my mouth shut. We found out, and began to search for the landmarks we had been given, mindful of the fact that the Grand Widow Warden's widow hadn't been here for ten years, and floods and rock slides could have altered things dramatically. She had been sure about a stretch of cliff marked with a white scar, however, and when I hacked through huge thistles, I found myself staring right at it. The livid streak where shale had fallen from reddish rock was supposed to point almost straight to the entrance, and I yelled to the others and got a bigger stick and began beating a path through reeds. Inside ten minutes we found the small round opening in the side of the ravine, just as it had been described and Yen Shi and I prepared to light the torches we brought. Then we discovered we didn't need them. About fifteen feet inside the little cave was a natural chimney leading up to sunlight. The place was illuminated like a corridor in a gallery, with wall carvings on both sides. Perhaps a third of the carvings were pictures, but the other two-thirds were pictographs, and Master Li was enchanted. It's an early form of the Book of Odes, he said delightedly, very close to the shamanistic sections called Nine Songs, but it tells a tale with a far different emphasis than anything found in later versions. As the sage translated the old script, a tale began to unfold that was very real in parts. This was the voice of a girl seduced by a god. His spirit came like a dense cloud descending, lit by a voice of blazing radiance. Beauty is destined to find its mate, for who so fair should be without lovers? He came thus with sweet words, with no words he left, flying aloft, riding pure vapor, leaving below a soiled skirt abandoned in billowing folds. Speedily, Lord, will I go with you. Let me follow over Kung Sang Mountain, let me see the teeming people of the Nine Lands. But my lord is riding the whirlwind, with cloud banners flying. I will wash your limbs in the pool of heaven. I will dry your hair on the bank of sunlight. I will gather sweet flowers to weave wreaths for the one I love. Wildly I shout my song to the wind, and, where, and stand where I am, slowly twisting a spray of cassia. The pictorial carvings had not fared so well as the crisply incised old script. Time had done its work, but enough remained to show the children born to the sad singer. If children they could be called, because they were the demon deities described by the celestial master. I caught my breath and instinctively stepped backward as I saw a little old man hurling fire, a murderous dancing master, and a disembodied dog head. But the subject of the verses wasn't eight monstrous children, 
but the ninth one, the boy born human whose only godlike attribute was his beauty. Master Lee's eyes were sparkling as the verses followed the boy's growth and triumphs until, as a young man, he had become companion to a king. No hero could stand against the brave cavalier. No woman could resist him. He rode one day upon Kunlun Mountain, where a great goddess was said to dwell. Oh, and this is his voice. Bamboo fragrance fills this lonely place. Long-haired grass weeps dew. Tall trees form a widening, a winding tunnel to curtain the sun with red roses, whose thorns catch at clouds. Drunken reeds dance in the pool's mirror, sporting with sky shadows. Dragon's eggs bubble and break upon the water, or is it fish spitting pearls? And in the depths the lady lies on her sea-green pillow. Lady, don your coat of fig leaves and rabbit floss girdle. Climb to your kingdom in the folds of rocky peaks. Come with rainbows for hair combs and eyes bright with laughter. Resentful with idleness, seeking a dream. O lady of lakes, mistress of mountains, seek me. The cavalier has never been refused, and he isn't now. Idle, bored, looking for amusement, a being who might send wise men racing for holes to hide in answers. To hide in answers the presumptuous mortal. In a carriage of lily magnolia, banner of woven cassia, cloak of rock orchids, sash of asarums, trimmed with tree-blossomed iris, she drives tawny leopards, leads great striped lynxes. Thunder rolls and rumbles, lightning splits the sky. I shall build a soft mountain bower for a pretty boy, peach-flushed with pride. With walls of iris and purple stone the chamber, flowering pepper shall make the hall. With beams of cassia, wild plum rafters, lily tree lintel, a room of lotus thatched with white flag, and melito and melilotus to make a screen. Chrysanthemum strewn to make the floor sweet, sweet polia, deer parsley, autumn orchids with leaves of green and purple stems, and a thousand flowers shall fill the courtyard. The cavalier becomes a favorite, as he has always been a favorite, wherever he's been, and finally the goddess allows him to use her chariot to bring the peaches of immortality for a banquet. Driving the team of plunging dragons on the homeward journey, he passes Jupiter, around which spins the never-ceasing belt of skulls that measure time. Pearls of the moon seed the cavalier's headdress. His tunic of rainbows brightens the sky. Cape woven from comets, a belt of lost stars. Shining bright in his scabbard is a shaft of the sun. He dies who dares not, he cries to the time star, and his sword strikes a skull. All rot who won't rise. The cavalier eats of the peach of the goddess and wins life as eternal as heaven or hell. The cavalier has been blinded by his envy of immortality, and when nature shudders in horror, he sees a dance of delight. He has been deafened, and when the Chao Ming bird screeches its warning, he hears paeans of joy. He has been maddened, and would take his whip to any mere star that might stand at his path as he calls to the dragons to race faster. Alone on the peak of her kingdom stands the Lady of Lakes and Mountains. Billowing clouds kneel before her, gray and lowering, smothering silver moonbeams, while the Lady summons thunder to rumble a path for her feet. Tiger eyes lift to a streak in the sky, tiger teeth bare, tiger claws scrape. Tiger screams reach out to jade dragons, bucking in traces, leaping and rearing. Tiger laughter greets a small figure, turning over and over through starlight and moonbeams, falling through sky to the mud of the earth. The cavalier lands unhurt in a bog and makes his way down a path that takes him to one of the lady's shrines. There he finds the fruits of his life with a goddess. In two boxes he finds two babies and two amulets with names on them. The boy is a twisted, shrunken, miserable little thing, and his amulet reads Hwai'i, malice. The girl is beautiful, but her eyes are frightening, 
and her amulet reads Fanglo, madness. In a third box, the cavalier finds a mirror and a third amulet, which reads Chi Tu, envy. When he looks in the mirror, he sees the goddess has indeed given a handsome cavalier the face of envy. He snatches up malice and madness and runs wildly into the woods, and his story abruptly ends with a very peculiar verse. Blue raccoons are weeping blood, as shivering foxes die. Owls that live a thousand years are laughing wildly. A white dog barking at the moon is the corpse's chanticleer. Upon its grave a gray ghost sings the song of a cavalier. We stepped back from the last inscription and looked at each other. Great Buddha, that sounded like a demented nursery rhyme, Yen Shi said. Either that or Li Ho had with a horrible hangover, said Master Li. He had insisted upon translating every word of text before continuing to the artifact the bandit chief's daughter had told us about. Now we squeezed through a narrow gap and turned sharply left to another chamber, lit by a shaft of sunlight, and the usually imperturbable Yulan gasped, and I yelped. We were looking at our burglar, painted upon a wall uncounted centuries ago, and still clear in most details. Around the ape man's neck was the amulet, envy, and in his arms were the terrible children, malice and madness. The head was bowed, and in a moment I learned why this place was sacred to Yin and not Yang. Master Li took my torch and lit it and swung it around to the black shadowed area opposite the transformed cavalier, and my liver turned to ice. Nobody moved or spoke. We were looking at a painting twice as large as that of envy, and I have seen few things more frightening in my life. Envy had to be the most daring cavalier in history, Master Li said, in an awed tone of voice. This is Xi, Xi Wang Mu, the great and terrible Lady Queen of the West, as she was in her glory before we Chinese tried to domesticate her and ease her safely into the pantheon. No wonder the death totems stand outside. The lady is patron of pestilence, and her servants are the ravens of destruction. Yulan was already on her knees, performing the obeisances and kowtows, and Master Li joined her, and Yen Shi and I weren't far behind. We arose in silence, chilled by the image that looked back at us from the wall. The goddess was a beautiful, was beautiful, except for the fact that tiger teeth protruded from her mouth, and her hands ended in tiger claws, and her lower body reflected the water origin of all goddesses, by ending in something like a dragon's tail, huge and scaly, and shining and coiling. Her eyes had no knowledge of time, and no knowledge of weakness, and no knowledge of pity and I thought I might almost be close to understanding the famous line that the great poet Master Li had mentioned, Li Ho. If heaven had feelings, heaven too would grow old. Master Li broke the spell by turning back to the transformed cavalier. Either he's still wandering around after three thousand years, or Ox and I have seen the greatest impersonator in the world, he said. One wonders what's a happened to the, his charming children, and what he's trying to accomplish. Yen Shi's eyes were burning as he looked at the painting. Burning with bitterness? I couldn't tell, but in his position I might be. Here was once a handsome cavalier given the face of a painted ape, and Yen Shi himself had surely been handsome before smallpox made him grotesque, and the patron of pestilence had mutilated both. Just as I was thinking that, the puppeteer reminded me he was an aristocrat, and aristocrats don't waste time with self-pity. A sudden sunrise smile brought beauty to a landscape of pockmarks. I can't speak for anyone else, but I find this delightful, he said cheerfully. Whenever I feel sorry for myself, I can think of this happy fellow. And when nasty brats like malice or madness creep toward me, I can put an arm around Yulan. His smile faded. 
Speaking of which, this cannot be easy for her, he said softly. As priestess of Wu, she is servant to the Lady Queen, and all the Lady's servants live in terror of their mistress. I hadn't realized that Yu Lan hadn't risen with the rest of us. She was still on her knees before the goddess, white-faced and still, and the puppeteer gently lifted his daughter and put an arm around her, and led her back out of the cave and into the sunlight.